Good afternoon. My name is Suzanne Brundage. I'm a master's student in the Health Policy and Management Program and a co-chair of the Student Leadership Circle, a committee that works closely with the Division of Policy Translation and Leadership in hosting these Voices events. It is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Mayor Boston Mayor Thomas Menino, also known as the Public Health Mayor. Throughout his distinguished career, Mayor Menino has promoted the notion that good governance is about helping people. Elected five times as mayor of Boston, having served continuously for 20 years, and elected five times as city councilor from Hyde Park, Mayor Menino has spent a lifetime building a better Boston for residents and businesses. His portfolio of accomplishments include reducing ethnic disparities, combating substance abuse, promoting healthy nutrition for children and adults, increasing the city's supply of affordable housing, and as we saw in the spring, bravely leading the city in the face of mass violence. A graduate of the University of Massachusetts, Boston, Mayor Menino was awarded an honorary degree from Harvard University this past spring, praising his decades of service and strong leadership following the Boston Marathon bombings. Before I turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Timothy Johnson, senior medical contributor for ABC News, please join me in welcoming Mayor Menino to the Harvard School of Public Health and to the decision-making Voices from the Field Leadership Series. Mr. Mayor, uh, over my many years at ABC, I had the chance to meet you quite often and talk with you, and it's a great pleasure to see you again here it's for this 100th anniversary of the Harvard School of Public Health. Congratulations to you all. I also like to congratulate Harvard School of Public Health for 100 years of educating us on the issues of public health. It's a major issue in our city, in our country, and how you integrate with the city of Boston and other agencies within the city. It's a very important uh, school in our city. It's, it helps us a lot. And uh, we know a lot of the faculty at Harvard School of Public Health also. They work with us and it's very important. Hey, this guy, he knows more about health than I do. Uh. <laughs> he's, a, he's the expert. I'm just here as an elected official. You know. But as the premier elected official in the city, uh, I'm going to ask you some questions very quickly about public health very directly. But we cannot pass up the opportunity to have you describe what it was like to be mayor on the infamous day of the Boston Marathon bombing. You were in the hospital when you first got word. Give us a, a first-person account of the next 12 hours, what it was like for you with, as mayor, how you had to interact with others. Well, I was operating on Saturday, and I was in hospital recovering. And Monday afternoon, around 2.50 in the afternoon, that's when the first bombing went off. Um, I was meeting with some of my staff at the time because we met daily in my office in the hospital room. And all of a sudden, my, one of my security officers comes in, Mayor, a bomb just went off for the marathon. And I said, Oh my God. And I said to uh, my staff, Okay, where's the police commissioner? He was on scene. He called me and told me hit what was going on there. Um, I said to everybody, Just now, we keep everybody calm. Let's execute our plan. And so over the next couple of hours, you know, the governor and I spoke. There was a couple of briefings, and my, my doctor said, you can't leave the hospital. And I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> he said, what do you mean you're leaving? I said, watch me put my pants on, put my shirt on, I'm out of here. First step. That's right, first step, out of there, out. And so I went over to um, the Western Hotel, where we met with the uh, ATF, the FBI, Boston police, the governor and uh, we talked about what was going on and uh, what we knew and what we didn't know. And um, I'm cutting short the second, second bombing also that was there um, and how we we're going to deal with it. I mean, the, of course, the FBI took the case over from the state and local police. And, but my job as mayor, I thought, the next 12, 24 hours was to make sure everybody in the city understood that we were in charge that the terrorists weren't going to stop our city, we're going to take over our city. That's the foremost I did, thought I had in my head. We're in charge, make sure that there was calm in the city. But within the next 12 to 24 hours, I decided, I said to myself, 
we have to do something for these victims. And that's how the one fund became uh, uh, re reality. Um, but I said I only wanted one fund in the city. I didn't want 16 different funds because if you have one, everybody knows where to send the money and you get out as quickly as possible. But the, you know, we kept on getting rumors about what was happening. And um, the police commissioner was talking to me all the time. Uh, the governor and I were having a conversation. And you know, we, I left the hospital several times to brief the public on what was going on. We didn't have much information, honestly. But our job was to understand, to tell the people exactly what we knew and keep them informed also. Because I always believe when you try to hide the issue and don't be out front on it, that's how you get in trouble. That's how you get create controversy and, and anguish amongst the, uh, the constituency. So that was happening. Then Wednesday, um, the Tuesday afternoon, the president called and said he wanted to come to Boston and do an event. We did the event at the um, Cathedral High School, I mean, Cathedral Church. And the governor and myself all gave us talks. And, um, and then we uh, met with the, all the volunteers who helped. The real heroes of the whole marathon, I think, the US police and fire, they were doing their job. But the medical staff and the volunteers are the real heroes who went beyond the call of duty. And we thanked all of them. And then um, uh, we went over to Mass General Hospital in the, in the, in the present, went up and met, met with some of the uh, survivors. I went back to my hospital, Brigham Women's Hospital, and I uh, went upstairs and met with many of the survivors that were in the hospital at the time. The interesting thing about the whole, and that, that was uh, Wednesday, that Thursday the rumors were continuing about what was happening. On Friday morning, around oh, 5 o'clock, no, 1 o'clock in the morning, I got this call from uh, Mitch Weiss, who was my chief of staff, saying that we had some information about this, this young man and these young men. And um, and then a couple of hours later, the governor called me and said, uh, you know, we have rumors that there's um, a bomb at Charles Gate. There's something else happened in the federal courthouse. We have all these rumors, something in a cab also. And he says, we should have a lockdown. I'm not in favor of that. But I says, why? And he kept on giving me reasons why. Okay, I agreed to it because it worked out real well for us. It means uh, I have to give the people of Boston and the surrounding communities a lot of credit. Everybody listened to us and stay within their homes, which helped the police do their jobs uh, during that period of time. But just an aside to that, you know these, these survivors and these victims? Let me tell you, they're the most courageous individuals I ever saw. When I went to visit them, they weren't you know, melancholy or sad. They were upbeat, upbeat. It was just uh, amazing to me. So then uh, Friday morning we, we did um, uh, call the uh, shut-in issue. Uh, Governor and I met. They, want, they didn't want both of us together in the city around the possible uh, areas where the bombs could be happening. So we went to, went to the airport to meet one of the hangars. And so we met over there, and then we got a call to go out to Watertown. Watertown was the focus of the uh, investigation. And so we went out to Watertown, and um, there, there we had a false alarm that we had the guy, so I hung around there for a couple hours, went back to the, the Parkman house where I was staying at the time, and um, my doctors kept on saying, you okay, you okay, I said, don't worry about me, I have a job to do. And um, so I went out there back to the Parkman house. As soon as I got back to the Parkman house, they asked me to come back to Watertown, we think we got them. And so we go back to Watertown, to the um, site where all the police were, staging area, and we had to wait about three hours before anything happened because there was one gentleman who stood naked in the middle of the street and they thought he had bombs, you know? And lay down, nobody would move him. They had calling a robot to help clear the site. So we waited around for three hours and then around, I think around six o'clock that night we got the call that um, they captured this young man um, in Watertown. He was in the boat. The issue that should be asked of this is, you know, every, every police department had an area to cover to go through and see what was happening there. How come nobody found this gentleman in the boat? That's a question nobody's asked. You know, he, he was there. And the police went in there and um, they started in doing their thing. Uh, and my uh, superintendent of police 
um, Billy Evans, who was a wonderful officer, was a guy in charge. He told him, stop firing, stop firing. I heard, I was listening to it on the police radio. So we don't know what's in there. And when they stopped firing, someone went into the boat, find the young man, and uh, you know, he, was, he was injured seriously. He didn't have any weapons on him either. He didn't have any weapons. So we got him, they got him, brought him to the uh, hospital. And uh, but I, then we came back to, uh, I, was, I, was, I was at the command center, the uh, commissioner of the department the, and the superintendent and some other officers and the state police, the governor and I, the attorney general, uh, we, we did a press conference. But I'm sitting in the, in the truck because I couldn't move at all. I was taking around in a wheelchair. I heard him on the police radio that we got him, Mayor, we got him. The police were, became relaxed at that time because they were on edge also. They didn't know what they had to deal with because, you know, two bombs go off within se several seconds of each other. They didn't know if it was a, a, a terrorist group or what was happening. And um, so we, the thing I was proudest of, after we did the press conference at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock maybe, um, leaving there, how the citizens reacted. On all the street corners, driving from Watertown to, to the city of Boston, People on the street corners singing God Bless America, Star Spangled Banner, raising flags. The Boston Com was packed with these. They're packed over Hemway Street. And my, my, super, my commissioner says, Mayor, we got all these kids in the streets. What are we going to do? I said, let them stay there. They're enjoying themselves. They were stuck in the house for, in the dorms for a whole day. Get them out there. Let them do what they want to do because they, were so, they just want to express themselves. I think it's a good release for them. And um, that's basically how the week went. But uh, the courage of these um, individuals that were hurt really impressed me. I've, I've done several dinners with them. I have um, took them a week after the um, bombing back to the site. Um, I wouldn't let the press come because they want to be alone. They want to be able to talk to them with themselves. And then uh, I took them to dinner also that night and I uh, was at, down the waterfront. I wouldn't let the media in there also, and um, they were very happy about that because you know, they're, 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 they're individuals who never had to talk to the media, and all of a sudden they're hounding them all over the place. And that's tough for them. And um, then we, take it down the mem we took the memorial down and brought them out also again to um, the memorial site just to make them aware of what, was, what we were doing. Took a lot of that stuff to the archives of the city, some of the stuff that was there, some of the stuff was not, couldn't save. And um, I took them to dinner that night also at the, down, down the waterfront. And they were so appreciative. And they've, over the time, uh, they've formed these uh, groups to talk with each other, which I think is so helpful to them. Because I've gone to a couple of them. And it's just, it's amazing the issues they have and, you know. A good forum for them. Oh, it's a great outlet for them. They just express themselves and Sometimes they express themselves to me, too, mm -hmm. which sometimes, they, you know, but I understand that. Um, and then we, uh, you know, this one fund, we were able to, we didn't ask for one penny. All the money we got was given to us voluntarily, $61 million. $61 million. The business, it's right, because look at the other ones, yeah. the other instances we had in this country, didn't raise as much. All this was voluntary. Everybody sent it in. John Hancock was the first one to send their donation and everybody else followed that. And we gave it away in eight weeks. And now we get, um, we're still getting some money into the fund. And the question is how we distribute the next time. So let me ask as a, as a leadership question, as you had to relate to federal and state officials, was there any territorial tension that occurred during this unbelievable event? No, I, I think we're all, if, if we all could work as well as we did that week, we have a better state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, let me tell you a little example of that. Down the, the South Boston waterfront, you know where uh, the restaurants are down there and some of those bars that you might go to, Priestley and all those other guys. Um, I know the names. I don't go in them. Um, <laughs> there's an issue. For many years, there was only real yards. No, no development down there at all. 
And now development's happening, and there's a jurisdictional issue of who's in charge, Boston police or state police. The state police say they're in charge. Well, we have, we want, it's about us having, be able to work together. We do that in so many other roads. I don't understand why we can't work as well as we did at the, at the marathon issue as uh, down on the waterfront. It's a real problem because, um, you know, you have a lot of development down there and uh, Boston police uh, know what's, you know, have a lot of issues, know the issues around the young people of our city and how to deal with some of this stuff. But, but if that week was a, a really an example, a case study of how law enforcement worked together. Myself and the governor always worked together anyways. But how we helped each other during this whole week, it was a tough week. I mean, personally for me, you know, I was just recovering, but that was okay. Uh, you know, when you're, you're a leader, like a dean or the mayor, or something, you have to show, show leadership. You have to be out there. People said to me, you don't have to be out there, mayor. If I wasn't out there, who would be out there? You gotta be out there telling the folks that what's happening, keep them informed. That's so important when, when, you're, when you're a leader. And that is why I always will always take the leadership part. Just go out there, even if it hurts, you go do it. Because that, that's why you get elected. Those of you who read the New York uh, Times Magazine oh, interviews yeah. know they suggest, well, we won't talk about Detroit, but we'll just talk about Boston here. <laughs> we'll know that uh, the claim is made that 50% of the people of Boston claim to have met you during your tenure. That's amazing. Yeah, um, I, you know, <laughs> I just do my, seriously, you know, if you're elected to a position or you're made a position, you have to get to know who your constituents are, and have them have f faith in you, and have and trust you. Trust is the biggest thing. And over my 20 years as mayor, I've been out in the neighborhoods all the time. I enjoy the neighborhoods because the neighborhoods give me information on what's going on out there. At City Hall, they give me briefing sheets and all that other stuff. What they want to, you know, their ideas. But I, I go out to the neighborhoods, I make a little different version of what's happening. And that's what fuels me, is being out there. Like, yeah, when I was, um, well, I wasn't hurting hurt the legs, but I used to go to two or three coffee shops in the morning. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> just to listen to people. Mm -hmm. Just to see what they were saying. You know, some people say that's simplistic. But that's why, when you're a mayor, mayor is the closest thing to the people. We buy our gas, we buy our newspapers, we go to restaurants, we meet our constituents every day. Some elected officials never get to, the, you know, they're 800 miles away. So let's apply that theme, that thought to uh, public health issues in the city. How do, you, how do you hear from the people when it comes to health issues? You've got all the officials you pick carefully, all the leaders in the health industry, but how do you have the equivalent of on the street information when it comes to their health concerns? Well. Been engaged in some of these issues. Uh, the obesity issue, how you got involved in that. I went to a, uh, one year, when I first got elected, I went to a Thanksgiving giving away turkeys. I see this kid is 12 years old. He had to weigh 250 pounds of weight, one pound. I was there with my public health commissioner. I said to Bob, I said, Bob, this young kid doesn't have a chance. He's so overweight. We gotta do something with that. And that's how we started our campaign of uh, educating the folks on proper nutritious meals and things like that. That's how um, we stopped selling sugary drinks in our schools. Toughest political fight I ever had, taking Coke machines out of schools. You know why? The teachers and the parents are against you because they make all their money for the field trips. But I say, you know, mayors usually win. And I won this one. Um, as much, you know, because Coke and Pepsi, they make so many different varieties of drinks. It doesn't have to be tonic. Um, but and how do you get it? I mean, I, my friends in the gay community, you know, I took my first position in the gay issue way back when it wasn't popular. I listened to them over the AIDS issue, on needle Eel Exchange. It wasn't, That's why you're still a councilman. Yeah, well, a councilor, yeah. And I stayed, you know, I, cut, I represent Hyde Park and Rosdale. Which is probably one of the most, everybody talks about South Boston being conservative. They live out in High Park and Rosdale, and uh, Matt and Rosdale, and those areas. We're a little bit, a little bit more conservative, I think. Uh, we don't show it as much. Yeah. I took that position. 
I didn't clean get needles, it. clean needles. Clean needles. I didn't get any static at all. Nobody gave me trouble. So some of these issues that get blown up in the media, they're really not issues. You really look into it. People care about some of these issues because it might be their brother, their sister, their friend. It's just a different world that I find than what I read sometimes in the media that they make you know, AIDS. Then, then those days it was, wasn't as common to talk about. There was no uh, solution. You know, we, have a, we have something we could do. Um, uh, but you know, that's how you do it. I mean, the, the South Boston Parade. You know, how you do that? That was a, a, one of my fun ones. Um, uh, when I was uh, mayor, just about maybe two years, uh, the folks in South Boston banned the gays from marching on the parade. And, you know, then I go to court, and we're still in the courts, and I made a statement that I'm not going to march on the parade. And all my political people said, you can't do that. It's going to kill you. I said, but I'm the mayor of all the people. I don't discriminate against who I represent and who I'm speaking for. I represent all the people. I'm supposed to make decisions for all the people. I made that decision. Never hurt me at all. Maybe I'm different, but they didn't hurt me politically. I got elected five times. I mean, one time unopposed, <laughs> and most of the times I won. You know, but just being honest. Get you know, focus on starting out in your careers. Always be honest and upfront, and communicate with people. I communicate with a lot of people during my day. It isn't people at City Hall, but people in the professional professional world out there, community development corporations, health centers. I, I communicate with them all. That's that's so important to you. Talk about the smoke-free zone battle. Oh. How was that? Oh, a smoke free free—that was a great one. Um, <laughs> John Auerbach was my public health commissioner at the time. We were discussing some issues, and he says, uh, "What about the smoking issue?" I said, "I don't like smoke myself." I says, "I don't smoke," and uh, he says, "We should do something." I said, "Let's do something about it." So, we came up with this plan to ban smoking in restaurants and workplaces in the city. That was several years ago, and uh, we came up with the plan. We had to make an announcement of it. And I chose, I don't know if anybody knows Doyle's in, West, in Jamaica Plain. My was probably one of the smokiest bars in the world. <laughs> I did it on Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I said, um, my one of my opening said, I'm doing this for people's heart, not allowing people to smoke. Um, you know, remember when you used to go in bar, restaurants and bars and get all that smoke on your clothes? And the only ones I heard was the cleaners, because not as many clothes are going to cleaners now as they were. We had smoking. But five years later, the state followed us. But I, I you know, another issue, uh, it was a tough issue, um, but it's the right thing to do. You know, if you're a leader, I always say, like as mayor, people elected me for my thought process, what I believe in. And once you sell that out to other people, a special interest, you get out of the business. You get out of the business. I always believed. I believed, I took the position, and sometimes my staff would go crazy with me, but I believed in it and I went forward. So I want, I want to ask a little about leadership style, and I'm going to read this uh, little episode that was described this spring in the Boston Globe article about you as the public health major. And, and uh, the writer was talking about the time when you were trying to get the Boston Medical Center and uh, BU to unite. Uh, and it says, quote, one night when negotiations at the city-owned Parkman House hit an impasse, Menino strode into the room, stripped off his watch, laid it on the table, and threatened to denounce intransigent parties on the 11 o'clock television news if a deal wasn't done. They missed the deadline but kept negotiating and reached a deal a couple of days later. And one of the people who remembers Menino that night whispering to him as he left, hey, don't forget my watch. That's right. That's so my question is, as mayor, you have obviously a lot of power. How much consciously do you think about leadership in terms of the carrot approach versus the stick approach? Well, sometimes use a carrot, sometimes use a stick. I mean, um, okay, we'll, we'll make the watch a, an example of the stick. Give me an, an example of the carrot. Well, when you have, you're trying to educate people about, say, a, a housing development going to a neighborhood, whether they're against it. You go out there and talk with them and tell them the real story. I mean, what happens in my business is there's elected officials who want to make 
got the names of the newspaper. All they care about is the name of the newspaper. They don't care about getting results. And I always believed it was about results and we go forward. They'd like to make any crazy statement. One time, we're citing a uh, home for special needs kids. And um, all the people who voted for it, there's a packed room, hundreds of people. And all the people who voted for it were, get up and said that they were for it when they had a vote for it. They got in front of these groups. Uh, I'm against it. And I got really angry. And I was thinking what I was going to say. So I went up there and said, I'm for it. A woman stood up and said, Counselor, we elected you to do what we tell you to do. And I said, that's the case. Put a computer in my office. Just press yes and no. You elected me to think. I mean, I think like, you know, I, I've been involved in some of those other issues where after the issue was out there and there was a lot of controversy about it, I go right back into that neighborhood and find out what I could do with that neighborhood to help them through the issue. You know, you might disagree on one thing, but there's always other places of agreement they come to. And, and I always found that in my career. That was always areas of compromise. You don't have to be hard and fast and everything. I always say to my staff, it's easy to get to no. It's much difficult to get to yes. Let's figure how we get to yes and work on getting to yes. Because, I, you know, when people come to see me, I got to say no, the issue is all done. But let's figure out how we get there. We want, we want to get it done? Let's figure out how we get there. Terrific. Uh, we promised to save half the time for questions from the audience, so we oh. will now open it up. Here's your chance to tell the mayor what you think or oh. want to know. Remember, I only have 108 days left. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody. Great opportunity. Okay, we've got the microphone. Actually, I'm holding the mic, but I also have a question. Okay, please. Um, and, uh, Just say briefly who yes, you are. Yes, so I'm, I'm Zach Nider. I'm a second year in the Health Policy and Management Department. And uh, my question is actually about transitions, which I think you what? probably have something to Transition. Transitions. Oh, yeah. Um, so a lot of us are going to be graduating, going into the professional world. And even if we don't kind of begin at a leadership position, our hope is that we're going to work our way up there. And oftentimes we'll be replacing someone who has been there for, you know, um, a, a considerable amount of time. And there's always a lot of um, opportunity, but also danger in sort of that transition from one person, from one person to another. Um, and making sure that sort of the, the historical memory of the organization is passed along um, to, the, to the replacement. And I think that probably there are responsibilities from both the new employee and the, the outgoing employee. And I was just wondering if you could kind of give your opinion on sort of leadership positions and transitions from one or to another. Or maybe give an example where you've had to exert some leadership in the situation of a transition. I never had a transition. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better uh, explain that. Uh, 19, when I took over as mayor in 1993, um, my predecessor <laughs> left on June 12th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'll never remember that day. But he left and just left town. We never had a discussion about what was going to happen or anything. We just left town. Went to be the ambassador of the Vatican. I understand that. So, but I was a city council then, so I knew how city government works. But what I'm doing now, as I leave office, I've uh, asked all my uh, cabinet officials to put, put together briefing books on everything that's going on in the department, what the problems are, what the good things are, and what the future holds for that department. I've asked my financial team to put all that stuff together in a book and also show where the finances of the city are. But, you know, as a young person coming out of the School of Public Health, you know, you might not stop at the top. I have... Um, a lot of kids, uh, like young men and women, who um, came from uh, Harvard Business School, who are with me, I got nine of them right now, I think. And uh, they started off just as a fellow, but now some are taking over departments. My chief financial officer was HVS. She was uh, started with me several years ago, and she's worked herself up to be. But you know, it's about you showing the um, leader of the organization that you have the ability to lead, and also you want to get engaged. And it isn't about nine to five, or you want to go there just at certain hours, you have to show you want to be engaged and you want to learn also. Because you're coming out of public health school, you know a lot, but a lot more out there in the real world. And you have to find out what the real world is all about. Yeah, but, you know, ask questions, reach out to other people for information in the organization and, and, and also in the outside the 
the institution you're in, but just find that out. You know, leadership is about you and how far you want to go with that. You know, I, I think my, my uh, chief of staff was a, a fellow out of the HBS, and uh, he's done a wonderful job for me. I mean, so you, you work yourself, you gain the confidence of the leader, the CEO, who it might be, and that's how it happens. You be honest all the time. I, I put that honestly in all the time. Be out there and willing to work hard. You know, nothing comes easy. You have to want to get down there and do the work all the time. And as a corollary question, what do you, how do you exert leadership when it comes to managing tension between staff people? Two competent people. Oh. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> but two competent people who have an honest difference of opinion and may even get a little personal, how do you manage that? I'm the mayor. <laughs> you do what I tell you to do or else. <laughs> Um, that's difficult. I mean, uh, in my administration, I really haven't had personality problems that, that came on the surface. But I, I, if I had problems, I'd bring them together and sit down with me and say, let's, go, let's figure this out. They're both valuable in, uh, in individuals. And it's just crazy that you two have a, this difference on these. Figure out how you come together and work together and communicate. See, a lot of this issue about tension between people working is they don't communicate. Mm -hmm. And that you have to communicate with each other, get to know each other. If you don't like them, you still have to communicate with them. You know, some people I work with all the time, I don't like at all. <laughs> but my job to communicate with them and try to work with them. But that's what it is. Sometimes you have to, your own personal feelings you have to put in your sleeve and say, let's go figure out how we make it work. You know, some of these uh, folks, the dean sometimes, has to work with some people that he doesn't like. Um, yeah, but You're just, next for the interview. <laughs> but that's what it is. It's, just, it's, it's, you know, it's not any rocket science. It's about people. Hmm. It's all about people. Your job, my job, his job, all of us. It's about people and how we want to treat them fairly and, and say if there's a problem, try to sit down with them. Have the patience to sit down with them and try to discuss the issue and find out where common ground is. Next question, please. Hi, um, my name is Lee Senderovich. I'm a first year doctoral student in the Department of Global Health and Population. Speak up. Oh, sorry. And um, as an aspiring scientist, um, I'm wondering if you could give any advice to those of us who spend a lot of time trying to produce rigorous, high quality data, what the single best way um, we can communicate that data to decision makers is if you have one tip for us. Well, you have, you have data, you want to get to the, to the decision makers? Well, you know, if you if in school, find out from your dean who the people are that make those decisions. And like with my administration, I have some folks where young people come to me with, with ideas, I either take them, I give them to my chief of staff or my environmental person, yeah, and that's how you flow up. You know, we should never, I never shut anybody out who wants to come in with ideas. And you have to find those people in the, out there in the real world of what they are, who they are. Yeah, that's, you know, and also sometimes there's organizations out there where you can make a case to them and tell them what your research data set shows. And also, you know, Public Health Commission, we have a great one in Boston. And um, that's how I do it. That's, I mean, I find that, you know, folks like yourselves, um, School here, I always cherish the ideas they come with because you know you're young, a lot of vitality, got new ideas. We have to continue to change those ideas, change what we're doing. If we stay stagnant, it means we're going backwards, mm. and that's so important. And continue to move ahead. You know, we all do. The dean has. We all have to move ahead. You know, go forward. Don't stay status quo. Status quo doesn't work. Next question, in the back there, please. And again, just speak up so we can hear, please. Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm a first year master's student in social and behavioral sciences. Um, and I'm interested in your efforts with the mayors against illegal guns um, and how you came up with that um, idea and how you um, no. engage the other mayors um, in that effort and what actions all of you are planning on taking together. She's talking about the effort of mayors for illegal guns, how that got started, how you work with the other mayors now on that issue. Yeah, that was a. Um Eight years ago, Mayor Bloomberg and I were having major problems with young people with guns and gun violence in the city. So Mayor Bloomberg and I were talking on the phone one day and we decided we should do something about this. 
So I went down to uh, Gracie Mansion down in New York, and um, we decided we had to create some kind of vehicle to get our message across about illegal guns. And so we met with uh, 15 other mayors, and um, we started then, about eight years ago, uh, Bloomberg and I co-chair the group. We have about 1,000 mayors now. I think we re represent about 25 million people um, in this country. We're trying, you know, it's not about gun control. It's about crime control. And, you know, that's the whole issue. You know, it's too easy to get a gun in America. We don't, we're probably the only industrialized country in the world that doesn't have some kind of control nationally. Every state has their own deal. We have some of the toughest. If I go to New Hampshire, you know, you have the gun show loop, loop, loopholes. You know, South, they don't have any rules at all. You can buy a gun in a grocery store. You know, so we need something. Too many kids are getting killed. Too many young people have guns. You know, when somebody gets shot in the city and there's a homicide, uh, the media always says, what do you think about this, Mayor? I always said the first question you should be asking somebody is where did the gun come from? How did they get that gun? And that's the real issue. And, you know, Congress hasn't done anything. They're letting the NRA run the country when it comes to uh, gun violence. They're running this country. It's a shame. You know, our delegation in Massachusetts is really good. But other delegations, they're all, they're all will bow down to the NRA every time a gun issue is raised. I understand the Second Amendment. If you need a gun for your own personal reason, yeah. But don't let it be so readily available through gun show loopholes and other things. I mean, look at this guy here who down in um, Washington this past week. How did he get a gun? No background check. Do you feel the organization is making progress? I mean, is this mayor's effort producing any tangible results yet? We've got some very, you know, we've made some progress uh, over the last several years. I made some movement this year. Um, but I'm not satisfied that we haven't got the gun show loophole uh, closed. I mean, you want to put assault weapons back and say, what the hell we need assault weapons? You know, they were banned for a long while. Why do we need assault weapons out there? That's a no-brainer to me. But we are making some progress. But we got to make a lot more progress. The availability of guns, I mean, what happens is they go down and buy these guns in another state, and they come back with them, and they rent them out. Or they have neighborhood guns where they hide them under a bush, and they use them for different purposes. It's unbelievable. I mean, and, you know, a kid 15 years old, where's he getting a gun? Somebody else is tra transmitting that gun to that individual. And that, that's, to me, that's wrong, and we, are, we should... Our country, our leadership in Washington should pay for it. Next question. Okay, here first, and then we'll move back to the second one. Thank you very much for uh, being here. My name is Germán Orrego. I'm a doctoral student in the Environmental Health Department, and I have a concern. I have here that here in Boston, there are more people that die biking than for air pollution, for instance how we can improve the cycle for bike or to avoid these accidents? Um, you know, I, I, the last four or five years, I've really started a cycling program in the city of Boston. We have uh, lanes now for bike riders. We have the hubway program. We can rent the bikes. Um, we have educational programs for cyclists and try to encourage them to um, wear helmets all the time. I mean, my issue is that the, the guy, the folks who ride a bike all the time, I used to ride a bike all the time, understand the rules, to enhance signals, have lights in their cars, wear helmets and all that stuff. But the ones who, the cowboys, I call them, <laughs> they get in a bike and they just go. They don't care about what the rules of the road are. They're the ones that cause us problems. But the guys who do it every day and do it for recreational racing or recreational uh, long rides, they're in the, but we have to continue to educate them you know, that's why I get a lot of static about these um, bike lanes I've put in. You know, they say they're taking parking spaces away. But also, I don't, want the, I don't want the car to be king in Boston. I want the bike to be king because it's an environmental issue. And we got clean air in our city. And um, coming a long way. We've come a long way. I don't know how long you've been in Boston, but a few years ago, we were at dark ages when it came to cycling. We've made a lot of progress. I mean, the hubway program we have, uh, the rental bikes, that's unbelievably popular. You know, it's unbelievable how popular that is in our city. Okay, and the second person there, please. Hi, 
Thank you um, for coming in. My name is Rebecca Obeng. I'm an MPA student here. Uh, my question to you is you mentioned the NRA and how big of an influence they have. And I'm sure that you've also had a lot of resistance to other issues from different groups. And I was wondering, how do you... Speak up on your... Yeah, phone. just spell that no, out. Okay. Um, so my question was, you mentioned um, that the NRA has a lot of influence um, in you know, resisting gun regulation. And I was, I'm was i sure that you've also had a lot of other issues where you've had a lot of resistance from other groups. My question is, how do you get around those sort of resistance? How do you talk to those people to try to get at whatever issues they have and that are concerning them? And how do you bring them to the table to have a meaningful discussion? And maybe a specific example of where there's organized resistance to something you wanted to do and how you dealt with that group or that organization. I'm the mayor. <laughs> so you can always get their attention. Um, a couple of, um, you know, the, the one that's tangible you can see is the convention center down in South Boston waterfront. When I proposed that in the beginning, everybody was against it. Newspaper said it's a bond doodle, a white elephant, and everything like that. So I had to bring the business community together. I had to bring the media together to understand what the economic benefit that was, and also would create jobs. And that was because, you know, change in Boston is difficult, let me tell you. To get something to change, wow. Uh, but putting a convention center there, so every other city had a bigger convention center than we did. You know, it was holding us back. You know, I had 250,000 square feet. This is about 650 over in the on waterfront. That was one of the big ones was that, um, trying to educate the public on the convention center. You've seen it over there. And now we have a, there's a proposal out there to expand it even further because we can't take some of the real large conventions in that are out there. But and how do you pay for it? You have to co get the uh, uh, consensus and we develop the uh, money for the uh, uh, convention center. I got a great deal last time. I hope I get a good deal. Oh, I won't be here for that one. Mm -hmm. But um, all the money I put into it, I got back because of the, how we put the finances together on it. You know, in the community, you know, you, li you listen to them and you try to, um, work with them on the issue. And you have to explain sometimes to the public, they don't have all the information. They only have from the, the official meeting goers who make all the noise information. If you go out there and try to educate them, a lot of times you'll, you'll win them over. But, um, you know, as mayor, I have a neighborhood service organization which goes out to the community in different, they have different areas goes to every community meeting and brings information back to me so I know what's going on in all the neighborhoods of Boston. That really works well. That gets us information back. So we don't make real decisions that are contrary to our, our, our neighborhoods. This is so important. I mean, because they're our partner. See why Boston works well today, I think? Because our downtown is doing well, but our neighborhoods are even doing even better. Neighborhoods aren't left behind in the city. If you look at um, some other cities, downtown does well, but the neighborhoods aren't doing well. But Boston, both are doing well. That's, that's so important as we go forward. Okay, right here, please. Huh. Um, hi, uh, thank you for being here. My name is Leo, I'm an MPH student here at the school. And I have a um, question regarding the, um, um, the environmental approaches that you and your team were taking. So you carry out a uh, plan that was called the, the Climate Action Plan and the Greenovate Boston where um, you try to achieve a reduction in 80% of the greenhouse gases um, emissions by 2050. So I wonder um, how are we doing so far with that? <laughs> We're doing okay. Um, matter of fact, two days ago we got the uh, number one rating in the country on the economic, uh, environmental issue, energy conservation. How are we doing that? We do New Boston, the solar programs we have in our city, educating the public on it and get them involved. You know. Uh, new, uh, most of our new cars in the city of Boston are uh, hybrids. We have some electrical car, electric cars in our city. But you know the problem with this whole environmental issue is the public doesn't understand the, the vocabulary. They don't understand what climate control means. They don't understand sustainability. We, somebody in this room should think about creating a dictionary and changing the words that we use on, on this environmental issue. Because I always believe the environmental issue was one of the next economies of our country. But it hasn't done that because the general public out there doesn't understand it. If I go to Hyde Park and talk about sustainability, it goes right above their head. It goes right beyond them. But you know, 
the solar panels. I got solar panels in my house. I wanted my neighbors to understand how important it was to save energy. I got to check all the time for it, you know, get more energy uh, generated than I need. But um, how do you educate folks on those issues? We've done a na nice job in the city of Boston. We knew Boston. We go out and check their homes for energy efficiency. We go out in the neighborhood. I was out in the neighborhood several times the past year in community means educating the public on renew Boston, what that means. And they do a great job of going to the house to energy audits of your home. It's all, you know, the business community is really engaged. I mean, um, Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, they're the first ones really put all their mechanicals on the roof in case of the flood that they will not get flooded. Like New York, the big issue in New York is a lot of those buildings will never open up again because they get flooded right out. So you have to think about what's happening with our oceans, the rise of the ocean, and uh, it's so important that we do those. Okay. Here, and then we'll go back there. My name is Charles Upton. I'm a second year master's student in the Health Policy and Management Department. Uh, my question is also about cycling and the Hubway program. Um, in a situation like the Hubway program where you're going to have benefits environmentally and with exercise, but you might also have negative effects from higher injury rates, how do you handle decision making for uh, decisions that have positive and negative public health effects? Using the cycling program as an example again. Well, cycling, you know, is good for, your, good for exercise, good for the environment, it's good for your health, and just you gotta educate the public. I mean, you know, come to, come to downtown, down to uh, City Hall Plaza this weekend. We have the uh, uh, professional bike riders there, we have perfect, professional rides, races down there. Sunday we have the city's ride through the neighborhoods of Boston. But yeah, there's no easy way of ed doing that. You have to educate them on what uh, riding the bike is all about, wearing the right equipment, and we just got to you know, do it. I mean, in certain neighborhoods I, we do real well with the issue, other neighborhoods we do very poorly. It's you know because of the demographics also. Younger people are willing to change, willing to do things differently. You know, some of the neighborhoods we haven't got yet, the younger people in there, and it's tough for them to change. Okay, uh, back here, please. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Mayor Menino. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm Christine Ordeja. I'm in the Environmental Health Department, and I'm wondering, you oversaw the Big Dig construction. I'm wondering if you're satisfied with that project, and if you think we have any other big projects in store for us, big dig? The big what that dig. might be. Well, Big Dig's worked out well. <laughs> I think um, a lot of controversy about how much it cost, but let me tell you that it was worthwhile. Uh, the issue with the big dig, uh, you know, get down to the cost factor, is nobody was managing the cost. Nobody held anybody's feet to the fire on the cost and overruns. That was a major problem. But the finished product is great. I mean, if you go down there on the uh, weekends, there's thousands of people there, the sprays and everything else. Now with the carousel you have there. But the issue we have to have, think about, is how it's going to be funded in the future. And I'm worried about that. Because it can't become a Right now, it's green. You have to continue investing in that uh, greenway to continue the grass and the, and the flowers and the bushes and have activities there. I don't want it to, my personal opinion, I don't want it to uh, be a gravel pit. But you know what it's done? It's correct the downtown with the waterfront. You know, I sometimes I get criticized from folks, especially in the Globe today, uh, not approving a, a building on the water, a tall 600 foot building. That will block the view of the ocean. We have a beautiful ocean. You can put the, why don't you put the building on the other side of the Greenway? So you have a clear view of the ocean. We have a great harbor. We have great views there. If I let this developer put it, it there, next developer next door will say, I want to do it here, here. So you have a real wall of all buildings and no access to the water. That's what this is all about. Nothing else but that. But sometimes, you know, they don't listen. <laughs> and so, they, you know. Other questions? Yes, please. I'm Mayor Manino, Lenny Marcus. Uh, we did the Meta Leadership Summit for Preparedness together. Yeah. Um, thank you for your discussion about the uh, Boston Marathon response. We're doing a leadership case study on this. Huh? And one of the questions, oh, one of the questions that we're getting in talking with people from other communities that's really unique about Boston, and I'd be interested in your insights, is the resilience of the community. 
certainly the resilience of the survivors. Um, but the sidewalks opened quickly. People got downtown. So from a mayor's perspective, from a leadership perspective, what were some of the key factors that you were thinking about in terms of the resilience? Well, my first factor was Boston Strong City. We came out of this much stronger than we went into it. But as soon as the uh, li um, ban was lifted on um, trauma on Boston Street, I had my team go in there, my business, my business team, my housing team, and go on and knock on every door, every business, and see what we could do for them. Be out there, be aggressive. We had five, we knocked on 500 businesses in, during this uh, time. And our job was to get the place back in shape as quickly. I went out for lunch there, just to show people that the place was open again, you could do business on uh, Boylston Street. But it was the message we sent there that we're out there, we're alive, we're doing well, and there was nothing to worry about. But it was that my, my team, my Department of Neighborhood Development, Sheila Dillon, her team was out there, business people, knocking on doors, seeing what we could do, expediting the uh, permits, anything they needed. Taking rubbish out of these uh, restaurants, had the food on the table, and they weren't able to open for seven days, and um, the food was gone bad. And get them out of there and throw them into a dumpster and get them out of there. That was just, they just by being there, helping them out, and, and showing uh, people that uh, we cared about them, but also show the rest of the city and the state, and maybe the country, that we wanted this place back in the same position it was before the bombing. And um, I tell you, it became a tourist attraction for a while. I mean, thousands of people came down there every day. They still do, because Boston Street's a great place to uh, shop and, and have a bite to eat. But, uh, it was just by us being there, uh, my department of development, reaching out to people, people in the housing. You know, they had to leave their apartments, and how do we help them get back in their apartments? That was important. Who would have thought a dumpster was key to the recovery? Huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we had another one here, and then we'll go back there. Two more here. Oh, here. Yeah, we'll get her first and then this young man back here. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us today. My name is Maria Portela. I'm a student in the master's program in health policy and management. And my question is, with such a demanding job like the one you've had and you've dedicated all these years to Boston, how did you manage to balance your political life with your family and your private life? Oh, my family and my political life? Yeah, how do you balance it? I'm lucky my kids are grown. Uh, so I don't have to worry about that. But you know, you, your whole life becomes your office. I mean, you, you, you know, you're 24-7, you know, and um, that's what it's all about. You make a commitment when you get elected. But this, is your, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be out there. You know, your phone rings at 2 o'clock in the morning. You have to, and something happens, you have to be there. But that's what it is. It's your life has changed when you take that out. And I hope the new mayor, whoever he or she may be, understands that. It's not a 9 to 5 job. They have to be out there. That's how you gain the confidence of people. The fire, when I first got elected, the fire in um, uh, uh, Tremont Street. It was 2 o'clock morning, I showed up. They couldn't believe the mayor showed up at 2 o'clock in the morning. These people burnt out of the um, apartment house. That's what it's all about. Politically, you know, I, I always think the way you, way you govern and where you lead the city is the best politics you can have. And it isn't about politics. If, if you look at my staff at City Hall, 99% of them never worked in a campaign for me. Never worked in a campaign. I always try to get the best individuals to head up my different departments. That's key because, you know, you always try to get the best talent. We have time for one really quick question and a quick answer. So can you make it quick, quick please? Quick answer. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sorry about that. He'll probably have the toughest question. Yes, yeah, so we were instructed not to ask about the next mayor. Um, <laughs> but maybe I can work around that by asking, um, as a citizen, what do you think is the quality that is most important for an effective mayor? Is it the friends they have? Is it the education they had? Is it the money they have? Or what, what do you think counts the most? Let me just say, I don't think money should be a factor, but it is. It's too bad. They have to have a heart. They have to like people. They have to want to be engaged. That's the key to being a mayor. You have to be engaged. You want to do the job. It's not about making headlines every day. You know, my, my, my press person's with me. I go crazy. I, I don't want to be in the I, I don't want to be in the press when I have to be. I'm not chasing them every day. But the new next mayor has to be, understand the universities. I understand 
the health institutions and be friendly with the business community, but have a heart. See, the colleges and universities and the hospitals, they're the, they're the foundation of your city. And you're always gonna work with them because they're the growth. When the recession hit every other city, Boston wasn't hit that hard because we were able to work, they were the growth factor, they were always growing. So I always tell the new, whoever the new mayor is, first thing is develop a relationship with the college universities and the hospitals. And the business community always have a good relationship with them. Don't get in major fights with them. It doesn't work. <laughs> well, I, haven't, I haven't done it for 20 years, so. <laughs> what I want to say at this point, Mr. Mayor, is as a mayor for 20 years, you inevitably had some uh, criticisms of your ideas and your policies, but I have never once heard anybody say that your heart wasn't in the right place. And so for that, thank you. I thank you. Thanks much, thank you.